I'm back. My name is Dr. Bill Roach, and I have been away for a long time. But what I want to do is bring you another episode of Timeless Dialogues, where we talk about issues related to theology, philosophy, apologetics, and much more. Now, I've had a few people reaching out to me saying, where have you been? Why have you not been putting out material? And my response has been, I've been very busy and unable to actually get to it. And, you know, as some of you know, I'm trying to teach and I'm trying to oversee some doctorate of ministry projects right now and teaching karate and doing jujitsu and things related to my family and our home. And I've just been really busy. But the truth of the matter is that I've also been very lazy about putting this out. And for that, I just ask for your forgiveness. And I was listening to this podcast recently with Jocko. And Jocko talks about a lot of things that I enjoy. He talks about working out and jujitsu and discipline. And he talked about how podcasting is easy in the very beginning. Like you could put out three, four, five, six, 10, 20 videos. But what about your 50th video or your 100th video or, or those kinds of things? That's when the discipline has to kick in. And he basically just called everybody's bluff on this. And he was like, in order to be a good podcaster, you have to be disciplined. And that's one of the things that I want to do is that if I can't provide you with good material, I'm not going to waste my time or your time trying to put it out. But he also talked about how in order to be able to engage in this type of format, you need to read and you need to study and you need to take time instead of being lazy, watching TV or all these other activities to pour into preparation for it. So one of the reasons that I haven't been doing is I've been staining our deck. I've been fixing our fence. I've been taking care of changing brakes on my car and all these different things that just require us in our day to day life, all while trying to serve in our church and meet with different people. But that aside, we are kind of past a little bit of that. And I want to put out a podcast on a figure that I deem to be one of the most influential figures not only in the 20th century or early 20th century, but maybe throughout the rise of the evangelical movement. And I think when the history books have been written, this figure will go down as one of the most convictional, leading pastor, theologian, apologists of our era. So who is it? It's R.C. Sproul. Many of you are familiar with R.C. Sproul. You've heard his voice over the radio. You've watched his videos on DVD or cassette tape through Ligonier Ministries. You've seen him debate. You've seen him at the large conferences and you've read his books. But what I want to do today is provide a video for you on why you should read or listen to R.C. Sproul. But before we do that, what I want to do is talk about why it's important to listen to these types of figures. God in his providence has given us a whole host of good, faithful, convictional, orthodox, orthodox in the sense not of Eastern Orthodox, theologians. And it's interesting because if you talk to people and you look at people's bookshelves, you see people read a variety of just crazy books. I mean, as it's been said, one of the most dangerous places in the United States can be the Christian bookstore and sometimes the church library where you're going, oh my goodness, I can't believe you're reading this, this, and that. But what I want to do is I want to talk about who was R.C. Sproul and what did he publish and why he's important so that you feel this desire to pick up his books. So first of all, R.C. Sproul was a, a figure that was converted in college. Now, prior to that, he would have said, man, I was lost. I did what all lost kids would have done. And he was going into college. And while he was there. He was getting ready to go off to Youngstown, Ohio, because he said they didn't check IDs over there, probably for alcohol in that sense. And he was standing at a place, and I, as I've heard it said, and as I've read, he was trying to get a pack of cigarettes out, and two upperclassmen came over to him and said, hey, RC, RC, come here. Uh, we want to read something with you. And what they were doing was they were having a Bible study. And they read a verse to R.C. Sproul that utterly perplexed him and drove him not only to consider his life, but further into the doctrines that are taught into the Bible. And people were probably wondering, well, what was that verse? You know, what, what was striking? Was it 
Was it something out of Romans? Or was it something out of John? Or maybe it was something from the Sermon on the Mount. And the reality is, it's no to all of them. The verse that R.C. was converted by was Ecclesiastes 11.3. And I'll just read this here real quick. It says this, If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. And you think to yourself, what in the world is in that verse that caused R.C. to reflect upon his life and to ultimately place his faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone? So here's what it was. R.C. saw himself as a dead tree lost in his sins. He was a tree that had fallen. He is a tree that, in many respects, as the verse might say, it's going to lie there. And that caused him to reflect upon the sinfulness of his own life and to pour before the scriptures and to plead before God that he can have forgiveness of his sins and salvation found in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's not like one of these figures that where they, you know, they're converted by John 3.16. It was almost an untimely verse, but it was the most timely verse for R.C. And many people go on and you read and you listen to R.C. talk about this, and eventually he talks about this in the book, The Holiness of God. A year later, when he was at Westminster College, he was going to the chapel at midnight. He's overwhelmed by just the sense of the, the glory of God and the greatness of God, but ultimately it was the holiness of God and that God cannot look upon sin, that without Christ as a mediator and a savior, we don't have access to God apart from his son, Jesus Christ. And the reason that this is important and the reason that we talk about the conversion of these men is that they were truly evangelical in that sense. In order to appropriate and to understand God, you must be truly converted in that sense. In order to understand and be a great defender and a great apologist of the Christian faith, you must be a truly converted individual. And that's why when you look at the conversions of the great saints of old, God sometimes uses obscure verses and random circumstances to draw them unto faith in Jesus Christ. And that's something that should be an encouragement to us and in our ministries, that God uses a variety of means to draw his people unto the end of salvation. Now, what I want to continue here is give just a brief overview of his academic background. He went to Westminster College, and there he studied philosophy. And if you listen to anything by R.C. Sproul, he was deeply influenced by the study of the history of philosophy. And we've talked about this on this channel before, how ideas have consequences, but ideas also have origins. And certain ideas will play different parts in not only how secularism might express itself or different views might express themselves, but also we as theologians must realize that we are butting heads with these aberrant philosophies. And in order for us to beware of all vain philosophy, we must first be aware of the different vain philosophies. And R.C. was incredibly influential in my life in this regard because his whole Consequences of Ideas DVD series and his audio, I actually got the audio first. I'd listened to them driving back and forth to work and different things. And they gave me a robust understanding of just the story of philosophy. Who are the ancient philosophers? Who are the medieval philosophers? What's rationalism and empiricism and all these different things? And where did he get this from? He got it from his undergraduate in the study of philosophy. And God used that time period to expose him to this classical literature and this classical way of understanding. And if you ever listened to R.C., you saw that come forth in virtually every type of lecture, whether it was him dealing with the original languages or to the key ideas or to the key figures. And upon graduating from Westminster College, he went to Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Now, that wasn't a robust conservative seminary by any way, shape, or form. And if you look at the things that we discussed on our video with John Gerstner, you'll know that in many respects, it was a denomination that was dying, and it was a church slash seminary that was moving left. So what did 
God give RC at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary? God gave him John Gerstner. John Gerstner was the main sort of influence over RC during this time. He discipled him and taught him the great doctrines of the Christian faith. And in fact, we talked about how, uh, you know, John Gerstner was known as, quote, the king of Calvinists, and R.C. became his heir in that regard. He learned Edwardian theology from Gerstner. He learned apologetics from Gerstner. He learned the classic doctrine of inerrancy from Gerstner. But he also learned many other things, because it's not just enough to learn these good, true, and beautiful doctrines. One thing that God gave him was is exposure to a bunch of heretical doctrines. He was exposed to neo-orthodoxy and, and theological liberalism and what it does to not only doctrine and systematics and to higher criticism, but to faith and practice, how it undercuts the integrity of what's going on in the local church, but also the way that we live our lives. So what went on with this is that God gave him Gerstner in order to keep him from falling away into these and to disciple him towards orthodoxy, but he also exposed him to all of these aberrant views. And there he, he graduated, so he had his BA in philosophy and an MDiv from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And upon graduating, he went to the Free University of Amsterdam, and that's where he learned how to speak Dutch. And he was pursuing various studies while he was over there. And I if I remember right, he, uh, he told me in a personal conversation once that he was studying things with Burkhoff and doing different things in, in that regard. But if you look at him, this is one of the interesting things. He received what was known as a DRS degree. And most of the time, I'll be honest, in my ignorance, I just kind of looked at it. I was like, ah, oh, that's just a different way of spelling doctorate. But what it is, is it's what's known as a Dr. Vandis. And it's not really a PhD. It's not really a full doctorate, it's sort of like he passed his comp exams and still had to do a little bit more towards dissertation research. Well, he came back, and from what I've read and from what I've seen, he never actually completed the, the fullness of the full PhD in that regard. He came back to teach at Geneva College and started Ligonier Valley Ministries and all the rest. And it was actually much later that he completed a full PhD or a doctorate, and he did that at Whitfield Theological Seminary. So when you look at the corpus of Sproul's academic background, he was a figure that came as an unconverted man to being one of the greatest defenders of the historic Christian faith. His background alone has always resonated with me because I was a very similar figure in that regard. I didn't have a background within the church. I didn't have a background in great discipleship and theology and sitting at the feet of, you know, somebody from from childhood. It was something that God gave me later in life, and it was something that God gave RC a little bit later in life as we were both into college and seminary and so on and so forth. But if you look at this, you see how RC was laser focused upon the truth that God has revealed and what it must do for the integrity of the doctrinal fidelity of the local church. So upon graduating, he was an ordained Presbyterian. R.C. was known for his commitment to classic uh, covenant theology, to the Westminster Standards, and eventually he became a part of the crew that joined the PCA, the founding of the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America, due to theological liberalism within like the PC USA and other branches within Presbyterianism. And he went on to teach at Geneva College and Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, or Gordon College sometimes also. RTS Jackson, which is in Mississippi, Knox Theological Seminary, and several other places. But probably the most influential teaching post that RC ever had was from Ligonier Ministries, or Ligonier, that he put out. And a lot of people have wondered, well, what in the world is Ligonier? And you think that it's this austere thing that he found in some ancient book, and he decided to name his ministry after it. But the reality was is that he named the ministry after a valley that was close to his home, Ligonier Valley, that was across there, and it grew to be the full ministry that it was today. Now, I want to plug something here real quick. Probably the best book on R.C. Sproul is titled R.C. Sproul, A Life by Stephen Nichols. And in this book, what he he does is he lays out the full biography of who was R.C. 
and all these different stories uh, related to him. And I just want to look at a couple of these. He looks at uh, the Great Escape, which was really his conversion. He looks at his time in Pittsburgh and his conversion with Ecclesiastes 11.3. He, the student professor, pastor, teacher, Ligonier. And then he looks at various things like the rise of Ligonier, his commitment to the doctrine of inerrancy, apologetics, here I stand or the stand moments, uh, new reformation and so on and so forth. So much more that comes. He gives a timeline of his life. And I don't want to go into too many details about the background of RC in that sense, because you can just get it in this book. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. And I'll put a link for you down below. And if you can just try to purchase it through that link. It helps both me and them and what we try to do. So we see some of the backgrounds that he had, and we see a few of the figures that came about with it. And one of the first exposures that I ever had to RC and actually personally engaging with RC was when I did a lot of work on the doctrine of inerrancy with Norman Geisler. And RC Sproul was a key figure with the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy. And during this time, what was going on was is that you see all of these evangelical schools were jettisoning their evangelical heritage in order to compromise with the doctrinal moves and trajectories of modernity. And that included a denial, dismissal, or complete just rejection of the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. And R.C. and several other figures, in fact, at first it was many Presbyterian figures, such as Gerstner and John Frame and Greg Bonson and, and several others, they worked to put out what was known as like the Ligonier Valley Statement on the Doctrine of Inerrancy. And they put on several different speaking tours and they were addressing this particular issue because they saw the net effects of giving up a high view of Scripture and affirming the total truthfulness of Scripture. But R.C. and others started to realize that this is something that had to get beyond Presbyterianism. This is something that was going to take a broader coalition of figures throughout the evangelical world. So in that, R.C. became sort of the chief leader. In fact, I think he was the primary leader of what became known as the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy. And he served as his first president, and I think in, in many respects, the most influential figure from it. He drafted the articles that were later given him and J.I. Packer did. And it's a funny story about it is that Packer was supposed to get them done. He didn't. And R.C. ended up finishing them and putting them out. And it, they met in Chicago and they had what was known as the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, which were a series of affirmations and denials stating explicitly, this is what we believe and this is what we do not believe. And they traveled around the country giving various lectures and publications in order to defend the total truthfulness of God's word. And if you go and listen to R.C. talk about this, this wasn't just something where they read the books. They went and met with many of the key figures. So you had Jack Rogers at Fuller Theological Seminary, and R.C. goes out there in order to figure out exactly where he's at on these issues. And R.C. ended up putting out with figures such as Norman Geisler and J.I. Packer and Francis Schaeffer and Greg Bonson and a whole host of other figures, the Chicago Statement. But he also put out this little book called Explaining Inerrancy. And what this was is it was an official commentary on the Chicago Statement because what happened is, is that people in subsequent years, they foresaw this happening. They were going to read the statement and interpret the statement in a way contrary to the intent of the framers, much like the United States Constitution and Declaration and all these different things where you know, people are trying to revise and revamp them, but we want the authorial intent. Well, they gave the interpretation of what those statements meant, and that's just a legacy for us today. Now, transitioning here, I want to look at one other area with R.C. for why you should read him. R.C. was known to be an ardent defender of classical apologetics. And for many of you here know that I'm a classical apologist and I kind of was a classical apologist, started to move away from classical apologists or apologetics and then returned to it. And one of the main reasons was because of this book titled Classical Apologetics by R.C. Sproul, 
John Gerstner, and Arthur Lindsley. Arthur, we love you, but most people think of Sproul and Gerstner on this. I understand. Sometimes you can be a second or third fiddle in those. But this was one of the greatest books ever to be published on a defense of classical apologetics. Now, it wasn't that it just laid out the traditional apologetic in that regard, but it took a ready awareness of the opposing view of the time and still around today, which is known as presuppositional apologetics. And some people like to say, well, R.C. and, and John Gerstner, you know, they, they misrepresent this whole idea of apologetics and, and all these different things. Well, one thing that was really interesting about this book right here is that Nichols talks about how when R.C. came back from being overseas, he met with Cornelius Van Til. In fact, he used to practice his Dutch while sitting on the front porch eating cookies with Cornelius Van Til. And what do they discuss? Apologetics and apologetic methodology. So it's not like he just learned, you know, presuppositional apologetics from the books or, or secondhand. He got it straight from the horse's mouth, Cornelius Van Til himself. Now, one of the things that you're going to find with R.C. Sproul is that he gave this classical defense that truth exists, that God is something that we can know from creation to a creator, a, a robust understanding of natural theology in that regard, that we can have not only knowledge of God, but actually certain knowledge of God from these theistic proofs that have been given to us. In addition to that, you see that they're building a case. Truth, God exists, the reality of miracles, the reliability of the Bible, the fact that Jesus Christ made specific claims about himself, that he predicted his resurrection, and then he actually accomplished his resurrection. And from that, he's validating all these claims, not only that the Bible is just a historically reliable document, but it's the fully inspired, infallible, and inerrant word of God, that Jesus Christ rose with certainty from the dead, that God absolutely exists in that regard. But what was so influential about this book is that they spent so much time actually engaging the other side of the argument, namely the presuppositional view. Uh, one really funny story about this is that in this book, they obviously had to lay out quotes and interact with the original sources. And one thing that happened in the writing of this is that they all composed their different portions and John Gerstner was working on the final section of it and he lost all of the citations. So not the quotes, but the citations, which are almost just as important as the quotes themselves. And RC had to go back through all that literature to find the actual citations. I would have lost my mind. That's why God had me born during an era of which you can have digital searches for that kind of stuff. So again, you see R.C. was so influential with the doctrine of inerrancy, with classical apologetics, but also R.C. Sproul was known and very influential with what became known as the rise of like the new Calvinism movement. And one figure gave a, a lecture on this, and the question that was asked was, where did all of these Calvinists come from? And he gave a whole series of things but in particular, he said a big reason for it was R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul, through a variety of his publications, and we'll look at a few of them here, he, in many respects, was the greatest explainer of the Reformed faith within the 20th century. Gerstner was great at it, but R.C. had so much more breadth in his reach and in his publications. He put the cookies on the bottom shelf, not being reductionistic being very clear on what he was saying, being very coherent in what he was saying, but he was explaining it in a way that the average person could understand what he was trying to claim. And probably the two most influential books that I have here, I, I'm not pulling out all of these. I know I'm grabbing a whole host of books here um, just because I got a lot of RC books. And frankly, um, I didn't want to go gather them all. But his most influential book that he published in this regard was titled Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul. And in this book, he looks at this whole issue of just classic Calvinism in that regard. And some of the chapter titles include The Struggle, Predestination and the Sovereignty of God, Predestination and Free Will, Adam's Fall and Mind, Spiritual Death and Spiritual Life, The Relationship Between Foreknowledge and Predestination. What about Double Predestination, or as he titled it, Double, double, toil and trouble is predestination double. 
can we know that we are saved? And then he offers a whole variety of responses to various objections here. And one thing that we have in this is that he gave just a clear understanding of what this is. He didn't caricature it. R.C. was just a classic Calvinist in that regard. Another book that he dealt with on here is titled Willing to Believe. In fact, I think this is probably the best one volume go to book on the topic. If you just want to survey a different views of the will, and it's titled Willing to Believe the Controversy over Free Will. And in this book, which I'm just going to read it again, he looks at Pelagius, Augustine, semi Pelagianism, Martin Luther, John Calvin, James Arminius, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, and Lewis Sperry Chafer, or we could say things like Pelagianism, which would claim we are capable of obedience. Augustinianism, we are incapable of obedience. Semi-Pelagianism, we are capable of cooperating. Luther, we're in bondage to sin. Calvin, we're voluntary slaves unto sin. Arminius, we are free to believe. Edwards, we're inclined to sin. And then all the rest, where you see just the, the resurgence of this. And R.C. used to give this, this whole thing where he talked about how we live under the great Pelagian captivity of the church in which people don't believe in a fallen will. They don't believe in the, the depravity of humanity. And they think that everything just is a free choice in and of itself. And sin doesn't affect anything. Now, I want to make a brief, brief caveat on that. Sproul doesn't deny secondary causality. He doesn't deny that there's a will. He doesn't deny that the will is choosing that which it greatest desires. What he's doing is, is he's denying a very specific understanding of the will, namely the concept of a libertarian view of will that says you both should be able to choose both A and B equally. And R.C. would deny that outright because he's a classic Augustinian in that regard. So you see R.C. not only giving us things related to apologetics and inerrancy and these great theological things, he gave us these issues in order to understand just the robust understanding of the Christian faith. And what I want to do is just point out a few more books here. Um, so let's do it with this one here, because we're kind of doing this a little bit on the fly, but not really. Um, one of the most influential things that RC ever put out was this called the Reformation Study Bible, also used to be known as the New Geneva Study Bible. And RC put together a series of academic figures, and they went through the entire Bible and wrote a commentary on virtually every section of the Bible. I'm not going to say every verse because I own it. I know that they don't have every verse with a little thing in it, but they go through the whole thrust of the Bible, giving you a great outline of each book. They give you a commentary on virtually every passage of the Bible, but they go beyond that and they give you a whole series of articles in order to understand the basic gist of systematic theology and what we're trying to do and the key questions. And then in the back, they give you so many of the creeds and the confessions, such as the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. You're going to see the Athanasian Creed. But you're going to see uh, you know, the uh, Canons of Dort. You're going to see the Westminster Confession. You're going to see the Larger and Shorter Catechism. You'll even have the London Baptist Confession in there. And you have much, much more. So one of the key things with RC was he gave us a robust understanding of the Bible. And how did he do that? First and foremost, he did it through his study Bible. And I would highly recommend you get one. Uh, even if you disagree with RC on his particulars as it relates to you know reformed theology, this is a great study Bible, and you shouldn't allow that to keep you from actually buying the Bible because it's a great study Bible. It has good intros, good study notes, great outlines, and you're going to have a deeper understanding and appreciation for the Bible. Again, I would also recommend Get different things related to R.C. Sproul on the doctrine of inerrancy. Get his lecture series on them. Get the books that he's written on them. Get his book, Classical Apologetics. Um, another one that a lot of people need to read, and I don't want this to go on for too long, is his book, The Holiness of God. And don't only just get the book, get the teaching series that I think you can find for free on YouTube right now. If not, you can get it on Ligonier Ministries. And he talks about why it is so influential to have a robust understanding of who God is and this notion of the holiness of God, that God cannot look upon sin. Now, another one that I had, but I didn't pull up here, was R.C.'s great treatment of what later became known as the book titled Truths We Confess, which is his full extended commentary 
But through the Westminster Confession, of which he goes through every article virtually on every issue, and he explains this classic confession within Reformed Orthodoxy. Now, a couple other books that I would recommend, uh, if you're looking for a few little basic intros from RC, I really like this book titled Defending Your Faith, An Introduction to Apologetics. And here is really just the summary of his video series that he gave on classical apologetics, one of the many that he did. And he's going to look at things like the essential principles for knowledge, the relationship between faith and reason, the, the case for God, God and the philosophers, and the case for biblical authority. His other great book on the history of philosophy was this one titled The Consequences of Ideas. Now, the, the issue with talking about, whoa, my whole thing almost dropped right there, people. Ha! Bear with me. One of the difficulties about talking about books with R.C. Sproul is this. He wrote a lot of them. And I can only give you a small sampling of them. Just go and look on Amazon or go to his Wikipedia page or go to anything that has all the publications of R.C. And you see, this man was a man of the pen. That guy knew how to not only craft a sentence, but how to write and crank out different books. So some of the others that I would recommend are his book, Knowing Scripture, but also the final one that we'll talk about, and then we'll, we'll start to close down here. One of the most influential books that R.C. ever wrote that affected my life was titled Faith Alone, The Evangelical Doctrine of Justification, right here. And in this, he's interacting with this whole issue of, you know, what do we do with evangelicalism, classic Protestantism in that sense, and this rise of Roman Catholicism. And you remember what was going on in the 90s. You had Chuck Colson and Packer and some of these other figures working with Roman Catholics, trying to put out a joint statement saying, for political reasons, we need to bond together under a common Christian faith. And R.C. would have nothing to do with that. Why? Because he saw justification and justification by faith alone as an essential to Christian faith. It was a doctrine upon which Christianity and the gospel in particular either was sustained or it would utterly fall in that regard. And the reason that's important is, is because he saw the integrity of what happens if you actually deny the doctrine of justification by faith alone. So why was this influential for me? Well, as many people know, there was a time period at a seminary that I went to where several figures were converting to Roman Catholicism. And I remember that this was one of the key books that I used as an apologetic against their claims. And I mean, one of them was a professor of mine, very dogmatic professor, uh, wouldn't ever kind of let you talk, you know, it was just going to clip you and not let you lay out your views. Or if you did lay out your views, they were obviously never robust enough because only he could do such things. And this book served as a catalyst to hold that back in my life. I mean, I was a person who, I don't think I was ever going to be swayed towards their view, but I wanted to give a robust defense against the Roman Catholic position on that. And R.C. gave me that, whether it be from professors or other students. And the logic of the doctrine of justification was laid forth so clearly, and it was so meticulously cited that this was my go-to book. And in many respects, it could be today. Now, in order to illustrate this, here we go. We got a new little, little setup here. I'm right here on the, in the side. I want to play a little video here by RC where he talks about this and the reality of what happens when we compromise the gospel. I was involved in a heated controversy about the nature of the gospel several years ago. Ligon was involved. John MacArthur was involved. He was standing with me in a very unpopular position. And when the fire was the hottest and I was losing friends by the bazillions. I walked into the church one morning by myself and I sat in the pew and I said, I got to read this thing in Galatians 1 again. And so I read everything that I've read so far to you, the emphatic warning that Paul gives about another gospel. And then I never realized the immediate connection between verse 9 and the next paragraph, verse 10. Galatians chapter 1. I'd never experienced this existentially, experientially until that day where I read. Paul says, for do I now persuade men 
or God? Do I seek to please men? Beloved, the single most frequent reason why people compromise and negotiate the gospel of Christ is to please men. Paul says, do I seek to please men? Well, I've got a problem with that. I'd like to please men. I like people to like me. I don't want to be anathema here to all of them. But he says, if I still pleased men, I wouldn't be a servant of Jesus Christ. Woe unto you if you ever negotiate the gospel. Anathema be upon you if you ever play with the gospel. Don't ever turn the good news into bad news because it's God's gospel and we're not allowed to tamper with that. In this video is that R.C was so meticulous in his reality that we must defend the gospel, that we cannot compromise the gospel. And this is something that serves for us today, whether it be the doctrine of justification is under attack, or it's the integrity of the gospel coming from the social justice movement, which is adding works unto the gospel, or whether it's going to come from political integralism, where we're trying to integrate Roman Catholic and Protestant theology in some political hybrid that's come about, we cannot compromise the gospel. And RC was such an ardent reminder to it. So what we need to find is, is that one of the things that we've looked at with RC is that people were opposed to his views because he stood upon the truth, whether it be in classical apologetics, classical theism, classical Calvinism, and I know that's a debated and I'm not going to get into that with some people, or evangelicals and Catholics together, or even the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. So why should you read R.C. Sproul? In fact, I want to ask this question here. Uh, why should you, if you don't like R.C. because you don't like his Reformed theology, why should you read R.C. Sproul? Well, first of all, you should read R.C. Sproul because he actually represents his view properly. He's not going to give a caricature of classic Reformed theology. And you should actually read him just to have a clear understanding of who R.C. was. In addition to it, you should read R.C. because he lays out what it looks like to interact properly with one's opponent. He's not going to misrepresent his opponents. He is a person who's committed to the integrity of rightly representing his opponents, even when they cried foul that he wasn't, because he actually was representing them properly. Sproul serves as a key model of what it looks like to have true dialogues on key topics and hard issues. He also, in this, provides an example of what it looks like to defend the Christian faith. He gave us a reasonable, rational way of understanding the historic Christian faith. But ultimately, and we'll finish with this, R.C. is somebody that you should read because he represents what it looks like to be a pastor, theologian in our age. He was committed to the preaching of the Bible. He was committed to the expository understanding of the Bible. He was committed to shepherding the flock. And I've got just two of these. I've got several more of these uh, little commentaries that they put out from Sproul's preaching, his, his whole thing on the just shall live by faith, his commentary on Romans, or the righteous shall live by faith, depending on how you want to translate that particular word there, or his book of Acts, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, commentary on Acts. I've got John, I think you've got Matthew, Mark, and several others. And I want to finish with this. This is just a, uh, a little letter here that was in one of the books that I had here. And it was a letter that was put out by R.C. upon his death. And I'm just going to read it here. It says, Dear Friends of Ligonier Ministries, More than a few years ago, a Ligonier board member said to me, R.C., we need to prepare a plan for the ministry for after you die. I said to him, I have no intention on dying. I simply plan to have a change of address. He goes on to say, 
If you're reading this letter, it means that my address has changed. My new address is permanent. In fact, it is eternal. Since moving here, I've experienced what I believe for decades, that Jesus always spoke the truth. As the Apostle Paul taught, my new abode is far better than my last one, and indeed is gain. Even now, my vocabulary is too impoverished to describe the glory of my present state. It is joy unspeakable, far beyond my earthly imaginations. Not only do I enjoy the blessed presence of Jesus, but I am also surrounded by the saints who were here before me. The vast multitude of them enjoy a far greater reward than I. But I've noticed that here, no one is jealous of anyone else's status. Here, there's no envy, jealousy, or covetousness. In fact, there's no sin at all. The board member was right about one thing. Ligonier did need to prepare for my departure. And indeed, it has. We have a marvelous group of teaching fellows assembled to continue the work of the ministry. Renewing Your Mind continues to air nationally and internationally. Table Talk Magazine has expanded. A publishing arm, Reformation Trust, has been established. The Reformation Study Bible has been thoroughly updated and is now being distributed around the world in several languages. Reformation Bible College has been founded and has graduated several classes. Several international partnerships exist that enable Ligonier to do ministry around the world. And he finishes with these two final comments. My passion on earth was to awaken people to the holiness of God. And in heaven, I now see that holiness face to face, but the need to awaken people to God's holiness did not end with my departure. From my present vantage point, the urgency of that mission is only magnified. I ask you now to continue to support the mission of Ligonier. The truth it communicates is of eternal importance. It counts forever. A letter that R.C., sent out right there to a variety of people. I know you can't read that, but felt good holding it up to you. So with that said, read R.C. Sproul, learn from R.C. Sproul, let God use R.C. Sproul as a means unto your sanctification. And if you don't know Christ, let God use it as a means unto your justification. Again, thank you. My name is Dr. Bill Roach. Tune in for more videos from Timeless Dialogues. Mm -hmm.